Prevention and which is one of the charity partners for TCS New York City Marathon. So I'm really happy to be here in support of all the good work. Today we have an amazing panel of guests. As I just said, Rob Simulcare is the CEO of New York Roadrunners, the nonprofit organization whose mission is to help and inspire people through running. They do that by providing free youth and community programs across the five boroughs and beyond and by providing a number of events, products, initiatives, one of which, very familiar, the TCS New York City Marathon. Rob, welcome. Thank you very much. I should say welcome to you. Thank welcome you. to the Run Center. Thank welcome you. to all of you for being here. Thank you. Next is Hyacinth Tyson King, is a social worker, who happened upon an open run in Canarsie Park back in 2016. Needing some form of physical activity to help her mental health, she reconnected with the sport, and despite struggling initially to complete the three-mile course, she kept coming back to Open Run because of the community. And now she has completed two virtual marathons and the 2022 TCS New York City Marathon. Next is Matt Kudish, is the CEO of the New York City chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, known as NAMI, which is an incredible, incredible group. NAMI's mission is to help families and individuals affected by mental illness build better lives through education, support, and advocacy. Welcome, Matt. And finally, Tracy Donnelly is the CEO of the Child Center of New York, an organization working to strengthen children and families with skills, opportunities, and emotional support to build healthy, successful lives. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. OK, we have a few questions. Rob, I want to start with you. Open Run is one of your signature events, and it really builds community. Can you share more about the program and, the, and how it helps your mental health? Sure. Uh, thanks, Cindy. So Open Run is, is a free running program that we run week in and week out uh, in five boroughs, all five boroughs of, of New York City. And, you know, it's, it's something that is, is, is important in terms of our, our mental health messaging because it's so accessible, right? Anybody can show up and run. And, you know, to take a step back, as CEO of Roadrunners for the last six months or so, I really wanted to focus on this idea of the connection between running and mental health. I think a lot of it just comes from my own experience, right? I know as a, as a human being who, you know, like all of us have gone through ups and downs, right? That one thing that I know I can rely on when it comes to just making myself feel better, right? Giving myself the energy, the boost uh, to get up and tackle hard challenges, deal with difficult situations, is just getting in a run, right? Other forms of exercise too, but for me, there's always been something about running and the kind of meditative quality of it, the feeling of accomplishment, the so-called runner's high that any of us who have run know about, right? That makes me want to spread the word, that this is something that can help while here we are in a period where there are so many people struggling with mental yep. health, right? Post-pandemic, we've all gotten more in touch with the idea of protecting and managing our own mental health. So, whether it's open run or one of our races or our group training program or whatever it is, we are trying to give people pathways to experience that positive benefit of running. Wonderful. Hyacinth, what drew you to open run and why do you keep coming back? Um, basically, um, what drew me to open run is that I love to do something to you know, maintain my mental health. So I was doing Zumba in the park and my instructor basically, she was late or she quit. And I was just walking around the park and I happened upon open run. And I started um, showing up like every Saturday. Mm -hmm. 
because when you run, sometimes you want to run by yourself, but sometimes it's good to have you know a group. And so going out to open run, it gives you that community, um, the camaraderie, and um, it's it's just like a party on a Saturday morning. And and sometimes you don't want to go out running early Saturday morning, so you just know that you're going to meet a group of people, and it inspires you to just keep going. Matt, much of NAMI's work centers on supporting families that have a loved one with mental illness. How does your organization provide them with support and build community in the process? A big part of the work that we do at NAMI New York City, as Cindy said, is around family support. I think very often when we think about mental illness, we think about the person who's living with the condition, and obviously those individuals need and deserve access to care and support and resources, but family and friends, people who love people who live with mental illness, are often left to make it up as they go along without access to meaningful education and resources and ongoing support from people who understand what they're going through because they've gone through it as well. So lived experience is really at the heart of everything we do at NAMI NYC, and we're what I call a high touch organization. So it's about bringing people together to talk about what's going on in a safe environment where they can be vulnerable and open and finally feel seen and finally feel heard and learn practical things that they can do to enhance their relationship with that individual who may be experiencing a mental health challenge and also to protect themselves and make sure that they're having healthy boundaries through that sense of ongoing support, which often, I'll use a running metaphor, these are marathons, not sprints, when we're talking about mental health. And so the knowledge and the skills can be really important, just as important as that support ongoing as you're trying to implement those skills. So bringing families together to share those same experiences is really uh, at the very heart of what we do at NAMI NYC. Tracy, the Child Center of New York also has a family approach to its work. Can you share more about that and how it's impacting the community that you serve? Um, first of all, we believe that healthy kids have healthy families and healthy communities. And I think for too long we've spent time, and just as you know, Matt just said, we really like to make sure that we're looking at every single thing that could make a family stronger, closer, uh, develop, and, and that's providing a variety of opportunities for the family to be together, to move together, to spend time, even if it's just sitting down and having um, some sort of a meal every night. And so we try to take a very holistic approach to uh, you know, looking at a child and everything that could impact them in a positive way. And also we take a really a strengths-based approach. And a lot of families really want to spend time together. That's what we find in our families. And running is, and movement like this doesn't cost money. It's just something where someone can run, someone can walk if you want to do a 5K, you can have someone riding a scooter. So we really try to encourage um, the whole healthy lifestyle around meals and, and running. So thank you so much. <laughs> what other programs, Rob, and events does New York Roadrunners offer to support overall wellness? Well, I think we're fortunate in that we're in the wellness business, right? So pretty much everything we do at the end of the day is, is supporting what, what we think of as wellness, right? We've got races week in and week out with sometimes it's 5,000, and then of course when it's a marathon, it's 50,000 people mm -hmm. running. And it's not just the races, right? These, you know, these folks are, they're looking ahead, they're training for these races, they're running you know, without us for you know, literally hundreds of thousands of hours collectively. So that's all supporting wellness. But we are you know, trying to serve folks in a lot of different ways, you know, whether it's our you know, youth programs, obviously, which is a huge focus of our community side of things, where we've got, we're getting kids at a young age in schools. Um, we're getting girls through our Run for the Future program, which is really focused on, on creating a positive body image and all of that. And then on the other side of the equation, on the older life cycle, we've got Strivers, which is a more of a walking program for older adults to get out and be with, be with, be with other people. But you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's physical activity, but it is also, you can, you can run by yourself, right? You don't yeah. need a group to run, but we bring people together as well, and it's the community aspect of this 
that is a big part of what we add to the equation because running in and of itself is just running. Running with others, that becomes a whole different story. And can I just say, I am not a runner. I'm barely a walker, <laughs> but my brother is a huge runner and he moves around a lot. He was in the military and the first thing he does wherever he goes is find that community. Yep. And so through him, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, Hyacinth, how has the open run improved your mental health? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a recluse. Um, I, really I, I don't know if it's working. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm a recluse, so it's very hard for me to, like, you know, like connect with people. And so an open run, it, it forces you to basically talk, meet people, and it's really amazing. I'm telling you, I've become friends with two, they call them the um, Canarsie duo. And because of them, um, I have started running. I started running uh, races. I joined um, NYRR. And um, like Cindy said, I have completed you know, two virtuals and one um, in-person marathon. And I'm already signed up for the marathon this year and many races. <laughs> so I can make my um, nine plus one. So I need to sign up for a volunteer. But yeah, the connection of Open Run, it's amazing. Like we know people in our community now um, because we meet up at our park and I, we have a wonderful park. So come out and join us, Canarsie. Um, <laughs> it's, it's great. And Hyacinth, we were talking about, uh, you were saying you're a recluse and with mental health and mental illness, isolation is one of the biggest things. And so the community that you found in these open runs, that's one of the huge things that helps with mental health. Matt, um, NAMI, you support so many different groups, young people, older people, everybody. But you have a very interesting um, program with middle school and high school students called Ending the Silence Program. Tell us about that. Yeah, Ending the Silence is an evidence-based program that's designed for middle and high school students. We talk about normalizing conversations about mental illness. We talk a lot about what to do if you're struggling or if you see a friend struggling, which often is about finding a trusted adult. But that program's been so successful, and actually it goes back to something Tracy said earlier, taking a holistic approach. You can't affect change among young people if you don't also touch the lives of the adults who are in their lives. So Ending the Silence has three tracks. The first is the program for the students themselves. There's a second track for faculty and staff in the schools, and a third track for parents and caregivers. So when we're able to get to a school community and teach the students and teach the parents and caregivers and teach the school staff and the teachers, everyone's starting to use the same language and identify symptoms or challenges in the same way. And that's really where we, we can affect um, the most meaningful change, I think. Tracy, your group approach is highly collaborative, providing community partners and providers with the tools and the resources and the support enabling them to meet the needs of their respective communities. What has been the impact of this approach on your work? Well, I mean, I think collaboration is really, really important, especially in this field. I mean, the government does not, are not able or capable to fully fund all of the work we do, and especially the work that brings people in, right? It's, you, you can get reimbursed for like the service itself, but all that work, and it takes time to build relationships. People are coming to you at a very vulnerable time or presenting to you their children. I mean, it's, it, it really is a trust issue. And we found that there's a lot of really small uh, community-based grassroots organizations that are already well-established in the communities we serve and have trusted relationships with the community members. So I, I haven't found that I've needed to hire people or walk into that space to do it myself. Instead, we've offered up the support that maybe a smaller organization doesn't have, like an electronic health record or um, some of the infrastructure support, which is also very hard to get funded from the government. Um, and we don't want to disrupt the relationships that are happening in these communities. So we try to give the support, and I think it, it gives people more access because then those folks can begin expanding their services in that community, and it's accessible. 
you want to get services where you live, not have to go traveling to get them. And you also want um, culturally appropriate and trauma-informed care. And that is sometimes very specific to where you live and your ethnicity or your race or what your experiences are. And we've had the opportunity to do that in, we're in all five boroughs, but we have a very strong presence in Queens. And that is one of the most diverse um, boroughs in the country. So this has been very helpful to us to have uh, language that happens and also culturally appropriate um, events and things to do. So the collaboration is really important to give us more accessibility, more reach, and make it more convenient for folks to attend. Rob, what um, additional efforts is New York Roadrunners taking to further increase awareness about mental health? Well, I mean, I think, ooh, that's working now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think a huge part of it, Cindy, is just that we're here talking. You know, I mean, think about this for a second. We're here at a, a run center, right? This is a place where people come to pick up bibs for races, to meet for group training. This is a place that's about running. And we're here talking about mental health, right? We're not talking about how to run negative splits in your races or what shoes to wear, right? We're talking about up here, right? And that's, I think, a huge part of what we're trying to accomplish by just putting this conversation front and center because I think all of you would agree, like, one of the problems is people just haven't talked about this stuff. You know, this is, this is something that if it was a problem in your family, you didn't talk about it. You know, you, you had that aunt, that uncle who had an issue and it was like a hush-hush thing. And to me, I don't know what you guys think, something I think fundamentally changed during the pandemic where because it became so common, right, so almost ubiquitous, you, to have kids or to have a family member or yourself have a problem, that it just raised the permission level to talk about this and in, in, in spaces where it wasn't spoken of before. So that, I, I think that's a huge part of it. Our, the social media stuff we're doing this month, the event we had in Astoria last week, like we're just talking about it. And I think that's making a big difference. You're right. I, I, do, I think the first step is always talking about it. And we should talk openly about it because we're all going through something is, is what I have learned. Um, Hyacinth, what is your biggest takeaway from Open Run? My biggest takeaway. <laughs> my biggest takeaway from Open Run is again community. Um, you know, as I said before, you can go out and you can run by yourself. I do it all the time, but that community um, on Saturday is something to look forward to for me to connect, you know, with with people um, and for me to meet with people. Can you guys hear Hyacinth? Um, Just a little bit? Okay. So <laughs> the, other, the other takeaway um, is that I would love to see a collaboration with children um, because I work in the uh, foster care system and I think um, instead of a prescription for a drug, it should be a prescription for running mm -hmm. um, or it should accompany that. If, if they do need a prescription, you know, they, of course that, that definitely is needed, but running should be a part of that prescription. And that's, that's one of your biggest programs, is, is getting running into the schools. I remember my daughter was running around inside the auditorium thanks to a program that New York Roadrunners set up. And Molly Seidel, speaking oh, of kids, goodness. I mean, she, we had a, an interview here a week ago with Molly Seidel, who's an Olympic bronze medalist in the marathon. And she talked about, as a kid, she realized that her brain worked differently and she needed something, right? And, and she discovered at a young age that running really changed the way her brain functioned. And it wasn't a, 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 a one solve ever for everything, right? She still needed therapy and medication and all those things, but it did something that really changed her. And that's, and, and so yeah, it wasn't a prescription that she got but for running, but yeah. she kind of gave herself that prescription. Now Matt, NAMI has an incredible thing coming up. 
I, uh, we were just talking about it, and it really incorporates movement. It's gonna, it's very different than years past. Tell us about it. Yes, Nami walks NYC. You all had postcards on your chairs. <laughs> I like to say it is not your grandpa's walkathon. So we do have a walk component to the event, uh, but more than that, it's a day of celebrating and coming together as a community, which we're talking about here, which is so important. I think you know uh, what Rob mentioned about um, being isolated and alone, and just talking. How important talking can be. Uh, one in five of us is living with mental illness. The other four are our family members, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, our running partners. We are all dealing with these issues. When you come and talk about what you're going through, it gives other people permission to do the same thing. And so often we feel isolated and alone and ashamed. You can't feel any of that at NAMI Walks NYC. It's uh, a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event. I would hope that you would uh, join, start a team, fundraise, and help support our work. As Tracy mentioned, the government very often does not cover the costs of the work that we do. NAMI NYC, 95% uh, of our budget is raised philanthropically, so the dollars that we raise through the walk, through our marathon events, our partnerships with New York Roadrunners, and other events uh, really enables us to offer all of our programs free of charge. But you do the walk, it's about a 3K walk, starts at the seaport, down the promenade and back, and we have a street festival when you get back. There's live mural paintings, there's a DJ, there's uh, activities that you can do, there's yoga in the morning, lots of opportunities to connect with other people and really make a day out of celebrating and being together as a community. So join us. That's May 20th, yeah. right? May 20th. It's on your chair. You're sitting on it. You're sitting on the card. <laughs> All right, this Child Center of New York is well known for its support of youth in the mental health space. And that work includes a partnership with New York City's Department of Education, community schools, and summer camps. Can you talk more about meeting the growing demand for the support that, that you and these groups are giving? Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, think about the amount of time that kids spend in school, right? It's a, it's a bulk of time, and it's also either the place that they're getting a lot of support or having a lot of uh, struggles, right, through uh, plenty of things that happen in schools. And, you know, we've all gone through middle school and high school, and you know how that can be. And if you have kids, you, you know what that's like, too. So um, we're very fortunate to have wonderful programs in schools. We're in about 15 community schools. Altogether, we're in over 50 Department of Education schools. Some of them have actual mental health clinics in the school itself, so that kids can access services when, it, when they're there, and they're not coming out of any core classes or anything, but it also removes one of the barriers, which is getting a ride there, having your parents get home in time, um, and we do some groups and some peer support to develop relationships. And then we also do summer camps. And, and all of these programs are really designed to address some of the needs that kids have, but it's also to overall take some stress off the family, right? So we do some sports after school and um, homework help and tutoring and test prep and the things that sometimes when you're getting home, if you're working two jobs and whatnot, you don't really want to have to focus on that. And it's also not the thing you want to define your relationship with your child either. So we try to do that kind of support. And then every summer, um, oh God, we have probably over a thousand uh, slots for a summer camp, and those are all free and within the communities that we serve. But they all have themes, and kids can be working on things um, around different countries or uh, sports, music. We've uh, also put in an arts program. Uh, so I also think having kids have something to do all the time, and this is one of the reasons I like things like running, yoga, martial arts. They're things that you can do rather easily, and you can do them by yourself, or you develop peers and people to do it. I personally, and I know it'll sound super unpopular considering what we're saying, um, I kind of like it because it is alone for me and isolating and we serve 43,000 people a year. I spend a lot of time with people and I try to go every morning because I feel like it, it sets the day. Like if you're able to get up and seize the morning, you're gonna have a much better day. And I like the idea that I, it puts me into a meditative state. So I'm, I run and I sort of breathe and that's all I'm focused on is that. And I know the rest of the day is not going to be that. So it gives me that little peace of mind and I feel like 
it does help my brain particularly to work differently. Um, so for me, it's, it's a, a private, personal thing that I really enjoy doing to set the tone of the day. And I think my staff probably thanks me for it too, along with my family. <laughs> but. And Rob, I just have to have you share what you were telling me, how running affects you. I mean, a day can start horribly and then... Yeah, so to what Tracy's saying, like <laughs> I actually have a phrase that I, I use at some of our races, win the morning, win the day, right? And that's really so true for me. I mean, actually, my last two days are kind of a testimony to that. Yesterday, I wasn't really feeling like it, but I got up, I got that run in from seven to eight, got that out of the way, and, and sort of the rest of the day, everything just kind of fell into place. You know, it was a really good, productive day from beginning to end. This morning, for some reason, I stayed up too late watching the Lakers game last <laughs> night, and I just could not answer the bell this morning. I could not make it happen, did not run, of course, it didn't help that my teenage daughter got out of bed in a horrible mood, so <laughs> things went even further south from there. And I've literally been playing catch up pretty much all day, trying to like reel back in the day that got off to a bad start. I snuck in a run at around three in the afternoon. That helped a little, but still, it just wasn't the same. So, you know, I think what Tracy's saying is true. I mean, listen, running is great any time of day, but I do think there's really something um, about it. Allison Mariella Desir has a book, um, which if you haven't read it, I really recommend reading it. Um, it's called Running While Black. It's about issues of diversity in running. But she talks about problems she was having with depression. And she just couldn't get out of bed. You know, she, and, and then you lie in bed until 10 or 11, and you, you already feel like a failure, right? Because you, you haven't done anything. And you just get up, you get out of bed, you do something, run by eight, let's say, and all of a sudden you feel momentum. You know, it's like a momentum play. And, and the momentum you get from that carries on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So yeah, I'm a huge believer in that. So in the morning? Uh, for me. In the morning, okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, Hyacinth. Um, now that you've done two marathons, what is next for you? What are your running goals? Keep, keep running. <laughs> keep running like Rob said to get up tomorrow and do at least four miles nice. yes um, Matt NAMI NYC has had a long partnership with uh, TCS New York City Marathon can you share with us how you are building community through this program yeah uh, we're so grateful for the partnership mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's, without a doubt, there's a connection between our physical health and our mental health. So we know whatever exercise we're doing, whether it's walking or running or yoga or anything, anything else that's getting your body moving, there's a lot of data that shows that it's really beneficial for your mental health. So when we first started our, our partnership in, in the marathon, we brought a team together and as a charity partner, and I'm not sure if other charity partners have experienced this, but people want to run. So when the when they find out if they're in or not after the drawing, uh, a lot of the charity partners are barraged by people who want to run who didn't get in. So we have an application process, and we try to pick the people who are going to be the most successful and really want to run with us for the right reasons. And what makes that so difficult is literally everybody who fills our application out has a story for why they want to run for mental health. Either they have a story that's um, they've been impacted, a family member of theirs, but no one's like, oh, I really just want a bib, or I just want to run in the marathon, <laughs> you have a slot for me. The stories are so compelling, and so the community is kind of a natural byproduct of the people who are running on our behalf. We always have a kickoff event where we bring the team together, people go around and say why they want to run for NAMI New York City, why this cause of mental health really matters for them. And then we organize group runs, so it's all about team building and community. This year, uh, we are bringing in a trainer to kind of really be very organized in how we're doing it. We brought someone in to oversee that, the virtual piece of it, the in-person piece of it, the group runs, the training component of it. Uh, we want our team to feel like a team, even if they're running at, at different paces. And then we always do a thank you event afterwards where they can come and bring their medals and celebrate and they bring their families. So it really, become, we cheer everybody on. We're there all day. 
from the early runners to the late runners, we are there because uh, what these folks are doing, the energy and the time it takes to train and then, to, I don't run at all. Uh, so I am in <laughs> awe of everybody uh, and being able to give them high fives as they run by and cheer them on. Uh, it's just as exciting for us as I think it is for them. I can see Tracy like I got to get some of these some of these charity spots. This sounds pretty good. I can see I can see your wheels turning down there. <laughs> we worked really hard to get them. We earned them all. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, so much of your work um, is organically. It builds in community, and you have a, a program called Cash and Communities Program. It's one example of it. Can you tell us about it? Oh my gosh, how much time do we have? <laughs> Can I take the rest of the time to do this? <laughs> this, is, um, this was sort of born during COVID, to be honest. It was right before I had read a book. I got really interested in it. And it was, um, we'll call it this, a uh, sort of um, redistribution of wealth program. So we, we right now have 300 families enrolled. And the idea is that we believe that communities and families know what they need to take care of their families only through uh, structural reasons, both financial uh, and socioeconomic, they haven't maybe had the same equal ground that everybody else has. And so it is a stipend or a uh, monthly reimbursement for people to give us data so that we learn from those that we can provide services to what people want and what they need from themselves. And it's called Peer Driven Change. And I had read a book, and, and it took all through COVID for us, and it was us giving out. We gave out about $800,000 worth of cash during COVID. And I used that as an opportunity to track the data. I didn't put any restrictions on it. And I, I saw what people were spending it on. And there were things that we didn't even know people needed, like paying their electric bills, uh, making sure they can keep their car on the road so they could work. Uh, licenses, people that had food handlers. So I use that to raise funds. So it's all funded through a private, private funding. And we have 300 families in it now, but the idea is you come in in groups of 10. It's all about community. And you have to support each other. And we started this, and they write goals, they do wellness surveys, all on their own. And as long as they go into this system and, and fill out the paperwork, they will get this money every single month. Um, as sort of a return for that. But what we noticed, and this is sort of the most important thing, and it was what I was hoping. So everyone kept saying, and this program's gonna work, right? And I was raising funds, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's gonna work. This is gonna be the big changer. And then I'd go to bed at night, and I'd be like, oh my God, I hope this works. Like, I would just wake up in the middle of the night, like thinking I'm really out over my skis on this. Um, but people can now apply for uh, scholarships, right? And you can get $1,000 if you want to do something wellness for yourself, whatever that is. And, uh, but if you want to impact grant, which is what we call it, it's $5,000. And that means what I'm, what I'm applying for is my own idea or an idea to help me and my community or the group of people I'm working with. And you can be part of Child Center or not, right? And we're completely full. So I'm just going to say that right now until we can raise more funds. Um, but we're collecting the data. What we're seeing is we're not doing anything. I literally have one person who's the director of it and then two liaisons that help the families. So, you know, get into the system, learn how to sign up and all that. But for the most part, what we're seeing is people supporting people. That they have businesses, women making clothes and selling them together, people collaborating on projects, people saying, hey, I can you know, help you make a dress for the prom if you can help me with the plumbing I need for my house. And so we are not touching anybody or getting involved with services. We're allowing the community to do it themselves through this redistribution. And we're seeing very positive results early on. And I, I just, I have to thank our, our sponsors and people that have done this, which are private foundations and private funders who have, are believing in us and taking a risk on this pilot. So. Uh, more to come. I'll be back to tell you that it really does work. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a question that everyone or anyone can answer, okay? What do you think is the greatest opportunity to increase support of mental health education resources and programming? I would say advocacy. 
I think uh, it's really important that the people who are making the decisions about how resources are allocated know what the needs are. They know, I think decisions are being made without a lot, I'm gener generalizing, but often I think decisions are made without the stakeholders in the room or the stakeholders informing what's going to happen. And so change is happening to us and not with us. And if we really want things to change, we have to be a part of that process. So it doesn't mean you need to become a policy wonk or a legislative aide, but just being willing to tell your story to people who have the power to make decisions about how resources are allocated so that they know what we need before they start telling us what they're going to fund. I think I, I would answer that by saying um, youth in schools. Um, we sponsored a conference here in New York last week uh, on physical literacy, mostly focused on kids in schools. And you know, it, it became clear in listening to conversations at that event that what's, what I see going on in New York is actually going on everywhere, which is you know, schools are trying still to catch up from all the disruption of COVID. Um, the shutdowns, the academic losses that kids experienced, the fact that test scores, if you look at the numbers, are still way behind where they were pre-COVID. And so naturally, schools are sort of throwing everything at that problem, and they are diverting funds from things like physical education and time as well from physical education to getting these kids ready for tests, you know, for reading tests and for math tests. And, and that's understandable, but it's also opening a huge gap um, when it comes to physical education and physical literacy. And I think maybe something's being lost in not seeing the connection between being active and being s successful and being able to achieve academically. If you're not emotionally sound, if you're not physically sound, it's very hard to be academically a high achiever. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's something that through our work with schools and the Department of Education here in New York and others, we'll be able to maybe sort of fill some of that gap that's starting to open up when it comes to schools and physical literacy. So for me, it's like, you know, keep the conversation going. It just starts with me. You know, um, every, when we were in the park on Saturdays, we try to pass out the flyers and I was having a conversation to say, you know, maybe we should start going like door to door and um, let people know that we are out there. Um, every time you meet someone, just have a conversation about the impact of running, you know, on your mental health and inspire somebody to do the same. That's just at my level, <laughs> without the money. <laughs> um, what is the biggest challenge to not only serve more, but also deepen the work with, with your constituents? Tracy? Well, I can, yeah. I mean, for me, this one is, um, it's kind of what we're trying to do with the Cash and Community Works. I think it's changing the narrative, which is a lot of what we're talking about up here. But in general, if what we've done in the so social service industry actually worked, we would see better results, wouldn't we, right? We wouldn't still have poverty, we wouldn't have uh, unspoken mental health issues. I think uh, COVID did a lot of, people were also exposed to each other, right? And I don't know, I think people were very busy and now all everyone's trapped in a house and you're sort of starting to see these things and we're talking about it. I don't know that, sometimes I kind of question when they say the pandemic has, made people have mental health issues, I think it exposed what always, always existed. And I think it gave everybody an opportunity to feel less shame around these topics because there was something external to blame it on. It was like, of course I'm depressed because of the pandemic. Of course I'm drinking more than I normally should. I'm trapped in my house all day. Um, of course, I'm not exercising, I'm gaining weight. All the things that people struggled with, depression and there was now something that was outside of yourself that people, I think, made it okay to talk about, even though we certainly treated mental health much more differently than we treated um, any kind of physical ailment, and they're really very much the same. You never hear someone say, 
um, you have cancer, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, how can I help you? People want to make you dishes and, and help and clean your house, right? And it's like, I have a mental health issue or I have a substance abuse issue. It's like, well, why? As if you chose it, you know, like make yourself better, go do something. And, and we're in a very unique time right now to be able to talk about it, attentions on it, and I think now too, people are willing to take risks and do something differently. So for us, we, this is the first year we actually have a research, development, innovation, and training division so that we can try new products that we've never done before, but measure them and be smart about it because we have limited resources. So they're like prototypes. Let's, let's see if this is changing, is moving the needle a little bit on engagement in our clinics. Let's see if um, this is moving the needle a little bit on generational poverty or the issues that we're seeing around women in the CDC report, young girls, you know, uh, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, I encourage you to look it up. And it was a recent, um, you know, study that came out around youth and how they're coming out of the pandemic and what their issues are. And teenage girls were, are really horribly affected right now. So there are some I think what we're learning is the opportunity now to do things differently and government, everybody, and I think more foundations are willing to say, yes, let's try something new, let's take a risk. And that is, that is a novelty when you work for a not-for-profit because we have zero margin of error. So to take risks and to be innovative and try new things is not really supported much and now we're in a, a place to do that. So I think doing things differently, changing the narrative, and making, normalizing what we're doing today. We're all sitting here, and I think Rob made a good point. I don't, people probably think we're talking to you about how to run. Nobody has any idea what we're talking about in here because I don't think we would have seen this um, pre-pandemic in places like this and people talking freely. Oh, go ahead. Just to, just to build on that, I think, you know, Tracy, and we've all talked a little bit about the importance of coming forward and finding the courage and the strength to talk openly about what we're going through. And I think that does a lot for reducing stigma, but I think it's only part of the story. We need to also create a culture of curiosity and inquiry so that if we see someone who may be struggling, we find the way to say, hey, are you okay? Are you doing all right? I'm noticing you're um, you know, showing up a little bit late to work or you're not coming out for those runs like you usually do every week and create a space for people to come out and talk about it. It's not enough to say, well, if you're living with a mental health challenge, you need to find the courage to come and talk about it. For some of us, we can do that. For some of us, it's really, really hard. There's a lot of reasons why stigma and shame keep us in the shadows. In some cases, the way that, that media or movies, TVs, books portray, or some elected officials perhaps, the way we talk about mental illness and the really damaging, incorrect, uh, way we conflate mental illness and violence keeps people who are struggling in the shadows. It's not, we can't say just come forward and talk about it. We need to sometimes throw people a lifeline and say, hey, if you ever need to talk, I'm here for you. I'm a safe place where you can come and, and talk about what's going on. And then just listen. I wanna take the pressure of solving the problem off of your shoulders. If you say to someone, hey, are you okay? You don't have to if they say, I'm really not. It's not your problem to fix then or solve. Just be a bridge to connect them to the places and the people who can. But if we don't start looking out for each other and really saying, what's going on for you? Are you OK? Can I help you? Do you want to talk? We're not really being, we're not creating that community and that team for people to feel safe and actually talk about what's going on and then get get to the help that they need. So I think that's, that's the other side of, of talking about it, is giving people the opportunity to do that in a really meaningful, non-judgmental way. I'm just gonna add to that. Um, when, you, when you do approach, if you, if you think somebody is in trouble, someone you love, be very direct, you know? And, and I'm gonna, I, I am on the um, board of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and what we say is if you think someone um, is going to hurt themselves. You need to ask them, are you thinking of suicide? Because
people can dance around it and you know just kind of push it to the side but if you ask act directly science shows it doesn't put it in their head and it also can give them an opportunity to open up and communicate and like you were saying that's not the time to judge that's not the time to say but your life is so good I mean you have nothing well how could you be depressed that's not the time for that that can make it a lot worse that's the time to as you said listen and hear the person talk and know that if that person needs um, is in crisis and needs help we now have a suicide prevention lifeline and it's 988 not 911 988 and you will get professional help through that but if it is in serious crisis and you think someone's going to hurt themselves you need to get them to the emergency room one last thing I'm going to say sorry now you just <laughs> let me go um, is that we were talking about mental health and physical health and it is the same Physical health, you have cancer, you go get it taken care of. You have diabetes, you, you, know, you do what you need to do, you go to the doctor. Mental health is the exact same thing, but you just can't see the scars, okay? And I know personally how devastating it can be. I feel super lucky to be here with you today and to have gotten a second chance. So I just wanna share that. Yeah. Do we ask questions? <laughs> we wanted to open it up to the audience uh, for questions for, for the panelists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this, is, uh, this is from Matt. Matt, can you elaborate more on the, uh, you alluded to earlier, the uh, positive connection between physical exercise and mental health? Yeah, every time we increase our heart rate in any way, we get our blood flowing, the oxygen in our blood gets to our brain, and that's really, that, that process alone um, just it releases endorphins and other chemicals that create a positive uh, feeling. The runner's high that you get is a, is a piece of that, um, but just exerting any exercise and elevating your heart rate has a positive connection on your mental health. Anyone else have questions? We, um, I was gonna follow up. I mean, okay. we, we talk about that, that runner's high thing a lot, right? And I don't, are you a runner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so have you, have you experienced that? Like, do you, do, you, do, you, do you sense that that's a thing you've had after running? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, maybe, <laughs> yes or no. Yeah, I mean, I, I find for folks, like it means different things to different people. Some people need to run 10 miles to feel really good, right? Some people can do it in two miles, right? But like there is a, there is something there, and yeah, I mean, the science backs it up, endorphins, all that, like there's a chemical reason, and then I think there's also kind of a purely mental reason as well, you know, just like feeling good. And it doesn't have to be a big run. You can go for a walk, mm -hmm. and just elevate, elevating your heart rate is good for your, heart health is good for your brain. It's good for your brain health. I was, I was just gonna say I feel it more after the run, not during the run. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a question on the open run? Is it kind of a run at your own pace yes. thing? Is, is that what it is? You yeah. can run or walk. Oh, okay. Yes, your own PR. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and the, I'll add on the open run real fast. The question was, can, can you run at your own pace? 100%. So most of them are, you, you show up at a park, there's a, there's a course that's kind of marked. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll show up, you'll see a starting line. Usually it's a start-finish line. And we have volunteers at every single one of these races. Um, you, you actually sign up online ahead of time, so they know you're coming. You, when you show up, you'll get a little, not, not a bib, but you'll get a little strip of paper that will serve as your unique identifier. And then you, you run the course, and they're usually you know, about 5K. You can walk as well. And when you finish, you get a time and, and all of that. So it's, it's not a race, right, but it's a, it's a run that you, you get a time and you can run alone, you can bring friends. So it really is like that, that casual running experience. And you also get incentives. So um, that's a big thing. Like, I think you run the first 10 and you get a t-shirt and it goes up to 25 and I think you get a long sleeve t-shirt and then 50 runs you get a real cool water bottle. Can, um, <laughs> 
in the, in the famous words of Fred LeBeau, never underestimate the power of a t-shirt. <laughs> oh yes, you can bring a baby, you can, you can push a stroller, you can, you can run with a monkey on your back <laughs> if you want, you can run with dogs if the parks allow dogs, so it's pretty much anything goes. Uh, so thank you for this. It was super informative. Um, I have a question that's only vaguely related, but I've been wanting to ask it uh, for a while, and it's more related to body positivity and to t-shirts. Um, so I've noticed that the t-shirt sizing that NYRR provides is really odd. Like, I'm your largest shirt, um, and I have a lot of friends who I've been trying to encourage to run, and I think it's very... Um, intimidating to start running and then once you participate in races to see that your size isn't accommodated for. Um, so it's just something I want to flag and I think we certainly don't want to cause any mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess this is just a note for Rob um, to, to think about moving forward because I think there's a little bit of work to be done um, on the sizing of, of your shirts. Thank you for that. Um, that's the first time I've heard that actually. So. I will take that and I'll go back and talk to our team about that for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you talk about it being intimidating, right? Yeah. And that's, I think that's very true. You know, I think um, it's one of the things that I'm thinking about in this role is how to lower some of those barriers to, you know, being a quote unquote runner, right? And again, you don't have to run in races to be a runner. What you're talking about with the shirts is something that, that is race related. But we want to have, we want to lower that barrier to showing up, to signing up for a race, to running, right? And we're thinking about ways to do that, whether it's new events or things like that. So I'll take that as something to put on the list as well. I mean, I know you're doing all these things, which is part of why I wanted to, to bring it up to yeah, you. So thank no. you. Thanks a lot. Pass the mic back there. Kind of going right off of that. And also, again, thank you guys so much for doing this. I think that it, we don't talk about it enough. Um, but on, on your note, um, I know that you mentioned that there's now a run with young girls and body positivity and whatnot. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that because I know also with the just, like recent statistics, it's I would never go back to high school if I had to, and I feel really bad for the you know there are girls going through it right now. I'm sure people have kids that are watching this, so if you could just talk a little bit more about that as well. Yes, yeah, so we have a program uh, that's specifically targeted at teenage girls called Run for the Future, and it is a it is probably the most kind of impactful um, program that we have in terms of the impact it has on the individuals involved. It's not big in terms of the number of kids. You know, we have each class will be 20, 25 girls. They apply and they get a number of things. First of all, they, they learn to run, right? So that we've got coaches who are dedicated to that program and we're getting them in a somewhat later age than most of our school programs. These are not seven and eight year olds. These are girls, you know, in middle and high school. And we're, we're getting them into running, teaching them how to run, what it's all about. You know, this is an age at which the research shows girls in particular fall off the sports participation curve. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll play a little league or they'll run or play soccer. And then all of a sudden they get to a certain point, usually it's middle school or certainly high school, and they stop competing for lots of different reasons, whether they're social or body image or whatever. So we're really trying to get a group of girls, give them an experience that's both running, but more than that as well. You know, we have these girls stay involved. We give them, you know, exposure to career opportunities and internships. They go to companies in, in New York City and learn about what a, what a bank does or what a, you know, different kinds of things that they can do. And we even have an alumni side of it. So girls who have gone through this program can gather and get together and sort of stay with it. So it's, um, it's a really interesting program. It's, it's a program that in my sort of six months here, I'm looking at and thinking, okay, it's great. It's small. How can we, how can we get more girls exposed to something like this? Because the statistics really are scary. I saw, I saw a stat um, just the other day that it was close to half of all teenage girls surveyed, right, had said that they'd, they'd actively considered, you know, harming themselves in the last year, right? It's, a, it's an incredibly scary statistic. I've got a 14-year-old girl and a 9-year-old girl before that, her, after her. So, 
you know, I would, it's even more on my mind because of that. But it's definitely um, something that we're, we're looking at and trying to figure out how to, how to really maximize it. Any more questions? All right, I'm just going to ask a final thought from everybody. Let Tracy go first. Tracy, you start. Bring it back to me. Um, so final thought is just first, thank you. And I'm really honored to be on this panel with everybody I'm sitting next to today. And quick little funny story is Matt and I got introduced by somebody like a couple of weeks ago. And we never met. And we have a meeting tomorrow to meet for the first time. But here we are. So we're both going to get an hour back of our time tomorrow. No, we're still going to meet. It, it has to do with work. So we're definitely going to meet. Um, no, I just want to say I think doing more of these uh, types of events would really be helpful because we also put it out on social media. We sent it out to all of our participants and people to watch. And, and I think it is sharing. It's one of the things we do try to do at Child Center when I mention we do drumming, all different arts, different kinds of sports, RBI baseball, flag football, softball, anything we can do to give kids an opportunity to try things so they can see what they're passionate about because you wouldn't even know unless you're exposed to things. So I, I would, I think some of these events would be fantastic where some folks can come in person but others can join virtually so if it's hard to get here and then maybe moving them around into the community for people to participate with and to say, because it, it's also, uh, there's no stigma in walking in this door or anywhere similar. So uh, thank you for doing it, appreciate it. My final thought uh, is to let you all know that you are not alone. Mm -hmm. If you or someone you care about is struggling with a mental health issue, there is help for you, there is hope for you, NAMI NYC's programs and services are all available free of charge to anyone who needs them. Call that helpline if you, if you don't know what question to ask. People are trained and uh, we're all about that lived experience. So we're people who have lived it, either living with mental illness or family members or friends of people living with mental illness. When you call or participate in our programs, that's who you're talking to. We try to have as wide a front door with as few barriers to entry as possible so that you just get connected and, and find the help that you uh, need and deserve. You are not alone. So my final thought is, you know, um, just keep having the conversation. Um, either, like um, everyone said, if you see someone struggling, you know, say something. You know, it, it might be just as simple as hello and a smile and, you know, invite someone to open run. Um, try to initiate an open run in your community. And um, I would love to see this forum being taken outside, um, like my agency. I would love to see um, the foster care agencies have a collaboration with running uh, um, some type of a, a sport club, like NYRR to come out in the community and um, you know just share the information. Mm -hmm. And I will take it back. I, I talk about it all the time in, in my agency. Um, I'm the running person there, so. Mm -hmm. They'll ask me, what marathon are you doing this weekend? <laughs> everything, is, everything is a marathon. I love it. <laughs> um, my final thought is just gratitude for, for you guys, um, Tracy and Matt and Heisen, for being here. Great um, thoughts, you know, really super thought-provoking conversation. So th thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I think that Roadrunners were very lucky to be in the position we're in as an organization. You know, we, we are a nonprofit. Um, not everybody knows that. We are a not-for-profit organization that, you know, as a group and the team I, 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 I look after and, and run at Roadrunners, you know, we're the, we, we have inherited something, right? We've inherited this great legacy of running in New York City that goes back actually to the 1950s, but people really know it from the 70s with the marathon. And so because of that, we have a really great economic model, right, that, that allows us to, unlike a lot of nonprofits, you know, because of what we're able to do with our races and all the sponsorship and all the things that go with our model, right, we know that we're gonna have funds available, right, 
to do things like this, right? To organize conversations like this, to do open runs, to do rising New York Road Runners in schools and run for the future and things like that. So I think I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to be, and we are very fortunate to be in a situation where we can do this. And so we're really just starting on this journey and, and talking about and being a part of the mental health side of this. Um, so I'm really excited for what's to come going forward. And lastly, Cindy, I'm very grateful to have you here doing this because I think you are uniquely able to have this conversation and to, to ask these questions. So thank you for being here as well. Thank you. Um, I just have one final thought and that is I would like everyone to take a moment and to think of someone who's having a hard time in your life. Have you thought of somebody? And I just ask you to text them or to call them and just say, I'm thinking of you. And, I, and, and just show your support and love because as we were talking, sometimes it's, it's just that one little message uh, that they need. So I just want to thank all the panelists who are out here. You guys are so wonderful. Thank you so much. How great were they? <laughs> I want to thank you, the audience, for coming out here. It is great to see so many people interested in learning about mental health. It, um, it means everything, because as we said, it, we really have to talk about it. We encourage you to learn more about what NYRR is doing to increase awareness by visiting www.nyrr.org slash, right, is that what it's called? Okay, mental health awareness. And there you can sign up for NYRR Run Club virtual mental health run on Strava. And also sign up for our Mindful Monday Meditation and the Run Walk Series. We can do the walk series, right? You and I can do yeah, the walks. You guys walk. all, rest of y'all do the run series. Um, it has really been great to be here with you uh, talking about mental health from running, walking, and just talking about this important issue. Thank you for being here. <laughs>